Genetic causation, perhaps not surprisingly, Francis Crick, uh, the discoverer of the double helix, one of the two discoverers, had a very deterministic viewpoint as far as causation from genes. Uh, you, your joys, sorrows, memories, ambitions, personal identity, even free will, uh, is really set up by your nerve cells and associated molecules. You might expect the discoverer of the double helix to be a strong proponent of genetic um, causation. I put this morning in my little magic machine genetic causation to Google. 2,767,000 citations came back from Google on genetic causation. There's a lot of work going on this. A lot of it's crap. Uh, some of it's pretty good. I'll show you a few things here, what they're trying to extend genetic causation into, which might surprise many people. Uh, I've got a mother-in-law who's a, who's a uh, a uh, big gambler. And if you look at this, there are lots, there are alleles that code for pathological gambling, uh, how you feel when you make money, how you feel when you take risk. And some really careful studies at Harvard and UCSD on very, very large populations found that 46% uh, genetic responsibility for those coding the genes for how popular you are which may sound to be completely wild and crazy, uh, but they have done some very careful work on this. It's Harvard, after all, to my Harvard friends in the room. Michigan State, uh, serotonin receptor, again, a variation of popularity. There was just recently, and this is, this is highly credible, New England Journal of Medicine, very careful, uh, peer-reviewed articles in NEJM, found that binge eating was strongly associated with a certain receptor with an allele that makes appetite controlling protein. So if you have a dysfunction in that particular, mode, in that particular area, a broken gene, a, an allele that's turned the wrong way, they were all binge eaters, every one. So stay tuned, there's a lot of work coming in genetics. As I say, it'll be of all kinds of qualities. This is a recent, very recent uh, article from Science, and what it talks about is the Homer neuron. Uh, I think many of you know Homer Simpson, and what they found, uh, it was a very uh, strange situation in which they could make these measurements. Uh, this was Caltech and one of the big, uni big English universities found that there is one neuron that codes for Homer Simpson. And whether Homer Simpson is, whatever he's doing, sitting down, standing, how he's dressed, who he's with, uh, how, what environment he's in, that one neuron is always accessed. That's the Homer Simpson neuron. Goes back and codes directly for Homer. It's all held in this one neuron. We're learning a lot about this. It'll be more fascinating as it goes on and on, but Homer, no matter how you look at him, he's one neuron, one, one neuron wide. Libet's work uh, on this hand flexing thing there are some contemporary extensions of that. This was just published 2009, September, there it is, uh, by these two fellows, that's Bhattacharya there, looked at more complex thought problems, not just moving your wrist, but what about you're trying to solve a linear, but not logical, not simple extension of ABC logic to solve a problem, some kind of thing that needs an aha, needs an insight. Is there any way to watch that solving of the problem phenomena, and when you know that an aha has taken place, you've got the solution, that magic moment we've all experienced. Very simple, practical problems. I've got one if you want to see it uh, at the end. Slapped an EEG on people and found that 100% of the time, the EEG could predict who was going to have the understanding and how soon they were going to have it. They found that from four to eight seconds, before you became aware of aha and jumped out of the bathtub and ran down the street naked, <laughs> the EEG said, solution's right there, already got it. So what that tells us is that in fact, the conscious thought does not solve those kind of problems, does not come up with the big understandings, even of some very simple logical problems. What happens is that there is processing offline underlying, that goes on, that delivers a solution when it's worked it out, however long it takes, days, weeks, months, hours, minutes, 
and delivers it and then says, here it is. And so four to eight seconds later you say, ah, what a fantastic discovery I've had. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that can be gleaned from modern complex systems theory, perhaps unfortunately called chaos theory when it was first discovered. MIT meteorologist was doing an experiment in the lab. Many of the MIT labs are kind of dark and dingy. Um, big computer modeling experiments. He was doing this, he thought, well, I'm going to take a coffee break. He was halfway through a run, left his machine, said, okay, hold, pause, print it out to the printer and I'll come back and put it back in later. Goes down, has a cup of coffee, comes back, takes that data off the printer, sticks it back in his program, and lo and behold, you can read ahead, the entire weather system changed dramatically. He had a three-digit printer and a six-digit program. The whole thing changed dramatically. So out of that came a whole branch of mathematics that he was key to. This is the thing called the Lorenz Oscillator. This whole new mathematical approach looked at the effects of seemingly very small, insignificant actions on the outcome of an enormous, complex, dynamic system. Many, many uses in the intervening 30-some years since Lorenz found this thing. Mathematics, topology, astrophysics, cardiac cycles, war, population biology, information technology, all kinds of approaches have yielded to this complex systems theory. The metaphor you've probably heard is a butterfly flapping its wings causing a hurricane in the Atlantic. It's that same kind of idea. Very small changes, you may not have any idea what the outcome's going to be but it may have an enormous impact on down the road. If you apply this to things like free will and intelligent choice, you find that you can drop it on top of many situations. Uh, we are arguably in our lives, because we're such a huge interrelated bunch of folk bumping into each other all the time. Our lives are very complex we can meet the requirements for a complex interacting system. The further you get away from initial conditions, the less predictable the outcome is going to be, not surprisingly. What may be surprising is that all parts of the systems bump into each other. If I do A and I expect B to happen, I expect C, D, E, and F to happen, it may not happen because B has many things playing on it. C has many, many things playing on it. By the time it gets to C, many things may have happened. D, E, F, and G. You have no idea, five, six steps down the road, what the outcomes are of the actions you've just taken. All kinds of things could have happened. Simple logic just doesn't work. And you can get completely unpredictable results even if you know the initial situations in great detail. The engineers in the room might say, if there are any engineers here, uh, well, I'll just gather up all the data ahead of time and I'll make a really intelligent decision for B. I can do that, thing. maybe. The data you have to assemble is so huge and so vast just to make that little decision to should I move this, this glass of water or not that you can't possibly run your life this way. It's like we are talking this morning, if you had, to, you had to actually logically, physically, mentally decide how to move your arm, you would never move your arm. It would just never happen. It would just sit there frozen in time. Human mind, that's, this is whatever it is, the bad news is these minds we have have very limited short-term processing capability. Six, seven, eight pieces of information can be handled at one time. You can change them, you can run out and gather more data, but you can only do six, seven pieces of data. If you're trying to manage your complex life, your complex world, you ain't going to do it on six or seven pieces of data if you're trying to meet the criteria we're talking about here in complex systems theory. What this gives us, we've all found this, is we've tried to make good decisions. Lo and behold, they don't work out the way we expected. We were very careful, very logical, even drew little charts, pros, cons, uh, checked all kinds of lists about Kepner Trago decision making, all kinds of things you can use. We all try that. Often it's just a bad, hopeless mess comes out of it. We couldn't have foreseen what was going to unfold actually. 